Hello and welcome to the My Heritage webinar series. I'm Jeff Rasmussen, your host, live from webinar headquarters in Middleton, Idaho. Today we have Mike Mansfield, who is with us live at My Heritage offices in Lehigh, Utah, for his class, Hidden Content Treasures You Might Have Missed at My Heritage. Thanks to Mike and thanks to all of you for registering for today's live webinar. Uh, so glad to have you with us. So the schedule and lineup of speakers has just been announced for the My Heritage Live conference. If you've ever wanted to visit Amsterdam, here's your chance to do that and to take in a genealogy conference at the same time. The second annual My Heritage Live will be held September 6th through 8th. And more information or to register, uh, that's available up at live2019.myheritage.com. And uh, you'll be able to see uh, both myself and Mike will be speaking there in Amsterdam. Looking forward to it. Also looking forward to Mike here today. Uh, Mike Mansfield works for MyHeritage.com as the Director of Content Operations. Previously, Mike has worked for Ancestry.com and Family Search and has been active in the genealogy and family history domain for the last 20 years. Mike has presented at numerous genealogical conferences and symposia in the United States. England, Scandinavia, and Australia. He holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from BYU and a master of science in library and information science from Syracuse University. Now please put together your virtual hands and let's give Mike Mansfield a nice warm webinar welcome. Mike, how are you and welcome back. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here again. Looking forward to this topic, as are lots of viewers here from around the world, Mike. And uh, I've got your screen there. It looks great. And so the time's all yours. Thanks again. Great. Looks like we're ready to go. All right. Let's jump in. Happy to give you this uh, some of this information. This is a brand new uh, session. So I, I think you'll find the content uh, new and uh, hopefully very useful in the work that you do. We're here to talk about hidden content, hidden content treasures you might have missed at MyHeritage. Just a brief outline. Why are there hidden treasures? So if you've uh, looked at the MyHeritage website or maybe have watched some of the uh, other presentations in the webinar series, you would see that we talk quite a bit about some of our record matching technology, our smart matches, record matches, record detective these things that help us find content automatically or auto-magically almost. And so I want to talk a little bit about why we still need to keep searching even beyond we've, even beyond those automated results that we get. So I'll talk a little bit about ad hoc searching versus record matches and, and why, and I'll show you some examples about why we, we can go beyond what record matching uh, will give us. And then how to do this, uh, you'll see me present a number of different sort of uh, techniques uh, that I've learned about as I've worked uh, with my heritage systems over the last uh, number of years. Really about how to find those hidden gems uh, that are buried down in the in the my heritage content universe. And uh, some examples. Uh, as I pick some of these out, it's kind of like asking someone, you know, who's your favorite child? Uh, we have th many thousands of collections on my heritage, many of which I've, I've been involved in the production of, and it's sometimes hard to pick your favorite, right? It's Some of them were harder to raise or, or produce than others. Uh, some of them uh, are, are not without their blemishes, so to speak, but many of them are, are just wonderful uh, resources that, that I'm happy to show you some of today. But again, just, just a few. There's no way I can really go over the many thousands of types of examples, collections that we could. And really what I'm trying to do by that is motivate us all to join in the hunt of searching for our family, searching for records about our family that will help us understand them better. And a lot of the techniques that I show here certainly apply to other websites and services. Uh, many of the things that I discuss will be applicable uh, as you go uh, around the virtual uh, world through the internet looking at other services that have search engines and online records. So keep that in mind. So if I come to my heritage, if I go to the research tab up here at the top, this is how I access uh, the search system at my heritage, which we call Super Search. Another method that I can find content that I referred to earlier is I can go to the discoveries, I can go to the discoveries tab 
and this is where I find smart matches. A smart match is a match between someone in my tree and someone of a, the same person in someone else's tree. But I can also look for what we call record matches. So these are matches between people in my tree on my heritage and the historical record collections that we have. That's kind of the main focus of what we're going to talk about. So I want to talk about why we can and should want to go beyond just record matching. So if I go here to matches by source, and you'll see here that on this page I've selected record matches. The option to the left where it says all matches, this would combine both the record matches and the smart matches into a single list. And then also under uh, this sort by option right here, in this view, I'm sorting by collection name. I do want to just jump over to a browser real quick and show you this kind of real time. So here's the MyHeritage uh, super search interface. I've clicked on the research tab. It's bringing me here. If I come to discoveries, I can search for matches by people and by source. Again, I'm going to go matches by source. The default, it's going to select this all matches option, which are both record matches. Again, so these are all matches would be people in my tree to historical records and to the other trees we have on MyHeritage. And in this case, I want to just look at look just at record matches. And by default, it's going to sort by the number of matches, but I can change this also to collection name. So as I scroll through this list, we'll First, we see that there's 92 different sources with 3,073 matches. My tree is not super big. It's, in fact, if I come up here to Family Tree and click on Manage Trees, you'll see that my tree here has, I think, just a less than 3,000 people. Yeah, 2,777 uh, people. So not a gargantuan tree. I, I see users quite often that have much, much uh, larger trees than I do. So as I go through this list of record matches, I see, you know, here's here's one match for a, a match that I have in one of my Danish uh, ancestors from our incredible Denmark censuses. You'll see I have a lot of Danish census matches, English, and I can go through this list and go down and look at this. And as I get to the bottom, it's going to continue to put more and more of these record matches in. Eventually, let me show you one that I would have us look at just a little bit. I would find, where is it? I want to show the World War I draft registrations. Let me see if I can find draft on the page. It just hasn't rendered it yet. So let me scroll down, and it will keep popping these in as I go. And while it's doing that, I'm going to come back to the deck because I, I have a slide that shows sort of what I was going to illustrate. So if I keep scrolling down on that page, eventually I'll, I'll see something like this collection that I'm interested in, this United States World War I draft registrations, 1917 to 1918. I'll talk about this in just a little bit later as one of my examples. And you'll see there it says that I have 10 matches. So at minimum, what this is suggesting is there are 10 individuals in my tree that the system has found what it thinks to be a very high, uh, highly likelihood accurate uh, match for uh, this collection in World War I draft registrations. And I can go and I can review those matches and I can decide if I want to accept them and then I go through a process of deciding if I want to uh, take any information from that draft registration record and put it uh, into my, or merge it into my tree. But just because it says that there are 10 matches there doesn't mean that there aren't more people in my tree that I could match with. And this is what I want to talk about just for a moment. And this is precision versus recall. This is sort of a, a technical topic that search engine people like myself really get into. But I, I hope I've made a, a nice analogy here that will help us kind of understand this. So when we talk about precision in a, in a search system, and again, this is true of MyHeritage or Google or really any search system that we use, precision is really how useful or how correct a search or a set of search results are. Recall is how complete or comprehensive these search results are. So this is where I'm going to jump into, I hope, a helpful analogy to illustrate this. So let's suppose a program, or in this case, a, a search system or a search engine, is written to recognize uh, photographs of dogs, right? This is all this, this thing does. It's trying to look at photographs and recognize uh, dogs. 
So in this case, uh, there's uh, I think 16 animals here on this page, 12 of which are dogs and four of which are actually cats. So let's pretend also in this search system that of the, uh, in the first result or the, the result that we get, it, it thinks eight of these are dogs, eight of the 16 total. However, you can see that it actually picked two cats as being dogs. So in this case, we would sort of rate this program, the search system as being 75% accurate in the precision metric, right? It got, of these eight results it showed me, six of them or 75% of them were actually correct, they're actually dogs. However, its recall is, is not as good. It's only hitting 50% of the actual 12 dogs that it actually pick. So precision and recall are often uh, important metrics that we look at in a search system. And what's important for our discussion is I want to uh, illustrate to you how record match and how we can do ad hoc searching to kind of optimize or get different precisions and recall for what we're doing. So in this case, this is what we call a true positive. These 16, excuse me, these six dogs, six of the 12 are true positives. The two cats that the system thought were dogs are what we'd call a false positive, right? We look at a lot of gene genealogical records. I think this is the most common thing we do when we're using online databases as genealogists as we're we're wading through endless numbers of false positives, right? Uh, this set, these are the other six dogs from the 12 that the system didn't think were dogs, and so these are called false negatives. That's kind of a, a double negative, right? These are actually dogs that we hope a good search system would return, but it, in this example, it didn't. So we have a bunch of false negatives. So what, I, what I'm not trying to suggest though is that genealogical records are like cats and dogs. They, they certainly aren't, but the complexity of, of determining what is an accurate match for any query or any person in our tree is quite complicated. And you can imagine that a computer uh, program trying to recognize these photographs would have a lot of complexity in it as well. So as we look at record matches, Again, I'm not going to talk a lot about record matches, but more just about what they're tuned for and so that we can understand how we can kind of work with them, but also uh, augment what we're getting from record matches. So these use information from our tree to form and issue very complex search queries. And it does it for many, many different permutations, you know, different ways that a given name might be abbreviated, different phonetic representations of a surname. Uh, all these different types of, of aspects, and it's going to do uh, lots of different permutations for us. And it's going to do it for all the people in our tree. And I love smart matches. They're wonderful. I'm not trying to disparage them in any way. What I'm, sh what I'm trying to show is, is that smart matches are, are super useful for what we do. But if we just rely on them alone, we're certainly missing a lot of amazing content uh, that we can find. And smart matches do all of this on a regular basis and we get emails or other notifications uh, to us about the availability of new smart matches, or excuse me, record matches. So for example, this is my great, uh, great grandfather, Matthew Winberg Mansfield. So from my tree, I have information about his birth, his marriage, his death, burial, you know, places where he lived. I also have information about his first spouse, the Sienna Ann Hunt, and similar, you know, vital statistics about her. She, uh, they had a few children, and then she passed away, and then he married this other woman, Annie Marie Bastion, and I have other information about her, and I also know information about Matthew Winberg Mansfield's parents, both his mother and his, fa uh, and his father, you know, and where they were born, and information like that, and between Matthew and his two spouses, there are four uh, children that at least uh, got past sort of the age of infancy. So there's a Matthew Lorenzo, an Elizabeth, a John Amos, and an Elias Edward. So as we look about, as we think about what a really robust search is going to do with this, you know, sort of mini tree here, is it's going to start to fill in a lot of fields here. So here's you know, the first name, the last name, the gender, it's gonna put in a birth date, a birth place, a marriage, a marriage date, marriage place, death place, death date, information about the names of these two spouses, and maybe a child or more. And this is kind of what record matches are doing in an automated way for us, right? It's filling in these search templates really robustly. It takes a lot of time for us as a 
as a human to do this, right? We're looking at our tree and we're transcribing records. So record matches are just great at doing that. However, record matches are tuned on purpose to have really, really high precision. So this means that when we look at record matches on MyHeritage, when we look at the, at the metrics from all the record matches that we present to our user community, the confirm and reject rate suggests that the precision is over 95%. So of 100 record matches that we'll present to our user community, they're gonna confirm on average about 95 of them and just reject five of those. However, this does mean that record matches won't present every possible record that exists in our collections that could match people in your tree. Again, that's also kind of the trade-off between precision and recall. And so what the algorithm is doing is if it isn't, I'm saying pretty sure here, if it isn't really sure, we could also say really sure that a candidate match is likely correct, it just won't show it to you. You just won't be able to see it in your list of record matches. And I'll show you some examples uh, of this uh, in a bit. So we kind of want, I'm, I'm kind of mixing two metaphors here, I, I hope you apologize, uh, but we want our cake and we want to eat it as well. So this sort of uh, expression really means we want to keep our cake, we want to have our cake, but we also want to consume it. And that's sort of the trade-off that we have with high precision and high recall, is we love really high precision, you know, search results that are usually, you know, say 90 or 95 percent correct, but we also want to see more of the content that could be related to our family. And these two factors are often at odds with one another. So ad hoc searching in super search is how we can control this sort of uh, precision and recall uh, situation. So we can directly impact the recall and precision. So uh, a basic search will give us a whole bunch of results. Many of them are gonna be wrong and we're gonna wade through those. And I'm sure you've pr probably seen examples of that and I'll show you an example in just a moment. But the more complex we make a query, we should expect to see higher precision, but less recall. Meaning we might put in a component of a search that could eliminate a, a good record as being part of our set. And so we also need to be prepared to deal with that. And again, part of what I'm trying to say today is there's just a lot of great content that we can hunt for in the MyHeritage collections that you may never see presented as record matches. And I'll do some illustrations. All right, so I'm gonna to switch to a quick demo here. So let me go over to uh, the live side again. I'm gonna click on the research tab to get us back to the search main search template. You know, I'm sure we've all done searches like this. If you have a John Smith in your tree, you know, we all commiserate with you. Uh, we all have situations like this where I do a search like this and I get four million results and I'm just getting categories over here on the left that are just gargantuan. And what MyHeritage does by default is it will give me results from the category uh, with the highest number of results. So in this case, the family tree category likely has the highest number of results. It's more than 10,000, but it's probably higher than any of the others. So in this case, this is a very, you know, this, this is giving me like everything about John Smith and our whole system. The recall is awesome, but the precision is horrible, right? And so we wade through these types of lists to weed out all of these false positives. Now, if I go back to my search and if I had more information, like this person was born in Loa, Utah, this is a very small community in the central part of the state of Utah where I live, where my family's from, if I do a search for John Smith in Lower Utah, I'm gonna, well, it should, let me go back there and do it properly, which would be go to the advanced search. Sorry, let me do just do this again. John Smith, I'm gonna click on the advanced search thing here and I'm gonna say events, residence, match required, in Loa, Utah. I'm giving it a more precise requirement, and look, I see no results at all for John Smith in Loa, Utah. I'm not surprised it's a community of just a few uh, hundred people, uh, I think even today. So let me come back, let's flip back to our basic template. If I search for a surname such as Tucker, this is one of my most uh, favorite rare names, his last name is Fudd Pucker. Tucker T. Fudd Pucker. Because this is such a rare, uncommon last name, doing a search like this can actually give me 
a reasonable set of results, right? I'm just getting six records for Tucker T. Fudpucker. Uh, he's a MyHeritage member. We have a record for him in our U.S. Public Records Index. Actually, looks like a couple there, a couple different candidate records, and another, again, from the U.S. Public Records Index, and another record of a member, perhaps uh, him or someone he's related to. Let me come back again and show you another way that I, I like to find sort of treasures in the MyHeritage content collections. That if, let me look for Ebenezer F. Wiggins. So this is one of my family members or ancestors. When I search for Ebenezer F. Wiggins, I'm, I'm given this list of 158 results, some other categories. I often like to go to the summary tab here in the upper right. The summary tab is often overlooked, but what it's going to do, it's going to it's kind of it's going to kind of realize, hey, Mike, you you weren't really giving us very good information. What specifically are you looking for? Or am I looking for this Ebenezer F. Wiggins in a census and voter list? So here's all the possible matches I have from census and voter list. You know, English census, U.S. census, Canada, uh, etc. There's more here that's not even showing me. I also have some results from family trees, such as uh, the My Heritage trees the tree from family search that we have, the genie family tree, births and death records, you know, all these different categories. And so often this is what, you know, technically we're doing is we're searching for somebody, but you were saying, hey, oh yes, what I was actually trying to find is this person in let's say the 1850 US federal census. So I click on that and it's gonna take me to two possible results. I have a person that's born in Kentucky and another one that's born in England. In this case, my my Wiggins family, they're from Kentucky, they're from this Mullenberg place. This is likely my guy, is this uh, record that I was able to find a little in a little different way than what you might have normally done of wading through all of the global search results on the results tab. So let me come back to the results tab here. And you know, I'm getting, again, because family trees have 117, those are gonna come to the top. Also here under the results tab though, I can also just click on census and voter lists over in this section. But instead of, you know, kind of clumping them by type, I'm getting sort of a kind of a, you know, random ranking almost of different results. You know, I might have an 1801 census and 1850 US, you know, who kind of knows what order they're in. And so that's another, that's a very uh, helpful way that I'd like to, to use the site is use the summary tab. It's, it's sometimes, my default view that I even just just immediately go to. Coming back to the deck, as we look at record collections on my heritage, I'm going to show a couple of these, and I just want to point out something that I hope that I hope is helpful. Uh, our our collections in general have what we refer to in a uh, sort of informally as a title card. So you see the example here of our large Sweden household examination books, 1860 to 1947. At the very top, you see a, a sort of a, a path or a breadcrumb of how to find this collection. And so what this breadcrumb is referring to is over on the live site, if I come to the research tab, we have this topical category. And so what this is saying, if I switch back again, this is in census and voter lists. Nordic census, so if I come to census and voter lists, I can click on that and I see we have sort of a hierarchy here. I can click on Nordic census. I also I already see the one I'm interested in, but I can go Nordic census and here's how I can find this specific collection. So, so uh, look at those uh, breadcrumbs, then we show you the, uh, the title. And then office, often a statement about the number of records in a collection, maybe it's the number of pages, if it's something like a newspaper. And then we give you uh, a short description. What I wanna make sure you're also aware of is if you see this icon here, the sort of down arrow in a circle, this is an indication that the collection has an extended description uh, that we'd encourage you to look at and study. Uh, we do spend quite a bit of time uh, trying to provide helpful information to you as a researcher about this collection, where it came from, some of its provenance, uh, some of the caveats that we're aware about, uh, aware of the collection, and to generally help you uh, be more knowledgeable as you search the specific 
content collection. So the first sort of example collection of just massive amounts of hidden treasure is this compilation of published sources. I've actually given a webinar here before uh, with Jeff on our book matching technologies, and this is uh, one of the main collections that we developed that for. It's 84.2 million pages with over 447,000 individual books. I mean, this is just a, a massive collection that's more books than are in many sort of medium-sized public libraries. And so here's the title card. Again, you see the breadcrumb there. So it's telling me it's in the books and publications subcategory, and it's called Compilation of Published Sources. Again, the title, the number of pages, and in collections like this that are compendiums, this is essentially a, a compilation or a compendium of many, many uh, smaller items. We'll, we'll try to give you an idea of how many of those smaller items have been compiled together into this one larger thing. If I go back to the site just real quick, I just want to make sure I, I've shown this uh, properly, how to find this. Let's say I want to find this uh, compilation of published sources. I'll come to the Research tab, and on the right-hand side, again, here's this category. If I scroll down, eventually I'll see the top-level category called Books and Publications. I can click on that. And generally, this is ordered by size. And so right here at the top, we have compilation of published sources. And I can search this and, and start going to town. Let me jump back to the DAC. So as I want to show, uh, that was the example I was uh, just showing you there, is how to find that collection. So there's a, an interesting bibliography that I've, I've loved and enjoyed for many years called the Bibliography of American County Histories. This is by William Philby. It was published in 1985. It's sort of a comprehensive list of, of over 5,000 county histories. And the, uh, the study that I undertook was picked, I picked a random county. In this case, it's Fairfield County, Ohio. And I wanted to see of the county histories that this bibliography presents, these five county histories, how many of them are in this collection of digital books that I just mentioned are on my heritage. And the good news is we have four of the five, these four top that I colored in blue, this bottom one, this history of Fairfield County from 1912, I was not able to locate in our compendium. So here's an example of a type of hidden treasure. If you haven't looked at these county histories that were largely published in the late 1800s, early 1900s, here's an example of the type of thing you're going to see. Here's the history of Fairfield and Perry counties, Ohio. They're past and present. We have a a very interesting sort of subtitle statement here, you know, a comprehensive history of Ohio, history of Fairfield, information about the city, villages, towns, a history of the soldiers in the late Civil War, portraits of early settlers and prominent men, just feels like it's going to be chock full of wonderful genealogical goodies, right? And in fact, it certainly is. If I flip over to page 363, just for example, I'm going to zoom in here on this person by the name of Slow, if I'm saying it right, his first name is Tall, Tall Slow, something like this. I get information about his birth. Uh, he was born here in Fairfield County in 1837. That's way before any Ohio uh, vital records exist. And he's the son of this Frederick and Mary. His grandfather, we're learning things about his, you know, his grandfather, this John Slow, was a native of Germany. And it just goes on and gives lots of wonderful information about his profession, his education. Uh, information about who he married, and even things about the fact that they, at the very bottom there, they were members of the Roman Catholic Church. A good clue to maybe uh, look for some possible surviving early church records from this part of Ohio if they survive. Here's another example from this set from Fairfield County, Complete History of Fairfield County. The types of things, again, just examples that you'll find are things like names of taxpayers in Fairfield County by township from 1806, right? This is kind of right between two important U.S. censuses. Maybe you're trying to find your, your family between one of these time periods uh, between the decennial census, and something like a county history might lead you to that clue you've been looking for. Here's another example of a, it's not only a biographical statement, it's autobiographical. So this uh, book has a statement by uh, this Samuel Griffiths, he's talking about his father, Isaac, who immigrated from Pennsylvania in 1818. Again, it goes on and talks about the occupation of his father, 
where he worked and he kept tavern. And at the bottom, he starts to even list uh, the neighbors that were there when they arrived in 1818. Just wonderful uh, genealogical information in these county histories. I wish I could show you more of these. Uh, I could probably do a whole session just on these county histories. So again, many, many thousands of these are uh, in this large compendium collection of, or this compilation of published sources we have on MyHeritage. Here's a title page of the third that I found, Pioneer Period and Pioneer People of Fairfield County, and then a biographical record of Fairfield County, Ohio. When it says illustrated, that often means that there's some sort of, say, woodcut uh, re reproduction of the, of the people's uh, sort of portraits. You sometimes can find these really wonderful uh, portrait books as well. Extending on this uh, experiment, I also wanted to see, could I easily find books in a bibliography like this, genealog genealogical and local history books in print? This is a multi-set volume that was published in the mid-1990s. This specific volume is just on compiled and published family histories. So I randomly selected a record from that bibliography, uh, The Descendants of John Hawk Stetler, The Immigrant of 1736 by Harvey Haw Stetler, published in 1912. And sure enough, I was very easily able to find it uh, in that book collection on my heritage. Again, these compiled family histories are just a treasure trove of incredible information uh, about families and who's marrying whom, where they're coming from, uh, things like it says here that one of these uh, family members was killed during the Civil War, uh, and etc. Just incredible sources of information. Another uh, nice example in that compilation of published sources are early Massachusetts vital records. So in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, many towns and agencies in Massachusetts started to compile their town vital records. And these were done for most of the Massachusetts towns and cities. And these volumes combine many different types of town records, church records, private records, uh, gravestone inscriptions, newspaper articles. They're kind of a compendium on their own. Uh, these were mostly published by the New England Historical Genealogical Society, uh, some other uh, agencies such as the Essex Institute, the Topsfield Historical Society, uh, among others. They came to be known the tan books. As you'll see in just a moment, the covers were uh, often uh, tan when they were originally published. Uh, so here's a map of uh, some of the towns as they existed, townships in Massachusetts in 1870. They continued to be subdivided and today the townships of Massachusetts uh, look something like this. There's uh, well over, I think, 350 different townships in Massachusetts. And the wonderful news is we have these tan books of these early Massachusetts vital records for most, not all, but most of these uh, towns in Massachusetts. Here's maybe about a fourth of the collection. You'll see that they're mostly these tan books that were originally published uh, about the 1910s is when they uh, were, were published. Some of the, the books that aren't tan are often reproductions of those earlier books. So for an example here, I took a random uh, township, Abington in Plymouth County, Massachusetts. And this particular township has two volumes in this set. There's a volume one of births and a volume two of mar marriages and deaths. Basically in these early Massachusetts vital records, they're always going from the beginning of the town or township to approximately the year 1850. So if your family is living, dying, or marrying in that time frame, these are a tremendously uh, helpful source. Here's an example of what some of the pages look like. On the left is an example of the births. You see that they're generally organized by the surname of the individual. So near the top on the left, we have an Augustus Bisbee. Uh, gives us information about, uh, looks like there was a baptismal record that was used here as a as a surrogate sort of uh, birth record. This person was baptized on October 31st, 1824. In the middle, you'll see, you'll see marriages. The wonderful thing about the marriages is they're basically indexed by both the bride and the groom. So you can kind of find the marriage uh, depending on which direction you're coming, whether it's the man or the woman. And then deaths uh, often list uh, other people uh, next of kin uh, of the decedent, again, organized by surname. So definitely look out for those early Massachusetts vital records, generally published 
uh, by the name of the township from or, or for which they uh, are were compiled. So again, that's the compilation of published sources. I wish I could give you even more examples of the wonderful types of materials you'll find hidden down in that just tremendously large uh, trove of information. The next one that I wanted to uh, point out is a wonderful collection to really mine for additional information that we sometimes overlook, and this is the United States World War I Draft Registration uh, Database. So the World War I Draft Registration uh, is just a, an amazing collection. Uh, May 1917, Congress passed the Selective Service Act here in the U.S., required all men aged 21 to 23, excuse me, 21 to 31 to register. The first registration occurred on June 5th, 1917. And then there was another registration later to pick up those uh, men that had uh, sort of become of age. And that second registration continued through uh, the late summer into September of that year, picking up additional men as they turned uh, 21. By August of 1918, Congress had also amended the law to expand the age range to include all men aged 18 to 45. So that uh, third and final registration essentially started on September 12th and included all men not previously registered uh, aged 18 to 45. And what, we're, what we end up with here is really all men born between September 12th, 1873 and September 12th, 1900. So if you go to this uh, collection on my hair, did you see some, some really nice uh, sort of index content like this? So here's a Luigi Caprioli, if I'm saying it right. I don't speak Italian. It's giving us information about his birth, uh, his nationality. But there's other stuff on the image that's not in the index, such as right here, the exact place where he was born, this village of Palamonte in Salerno. So these World War I draft records are just a huge trove of immigration data that we wouldn't necessarily consider. It's, it's often considered a military collection, uh, but I like it for its, its immigration uh, information that it collects. Here's another example. Uh, so here's a, here's a George. He's 21 years old, and he was born in Macedonia, Greece on, on this particular version of the form, we see that his father's birthplace is in Greece. Uh, looks like the same place there in Macedonia. And for the name of his nearest relative, he lists his mother, who is actually still living in Macedonia, Greece. So this wonderful information about this Greek immigrant uh, here in Syracuse, New York, is where he's living. And he's registering for the uh, draft and we are picking up information about his parents back in Greece and where he was born. Here's uh, just some statistics to whet your appetite a little bit of, a, of this uh, collection. Of, there's about 23 million records in this World War I draft collection. And here I'm giving you a fill for the counts of how many uh, persons are reporting their nationality by country. So almost over half a million Italians, over half a million Russians, you know, 120,000 Canadians, just a, just a very wide uh, swath of immigrants uh, were in the country when that collection was collected. The next one I want to point out is uh, this uh, large collection of newspapers chronicling America, historic American newspapers, 1836 to 1922. Where did this come from? This came from the National, uh, excuse me, from the Library of Congress. The National Endowment for the Humanities uh, for many years has been running a program with uh, various uh, agencies throughout the U.S. states and its territories to digitize uh, newspapers. Uh, every year they, they issue grants to uh, a set of agencies around the country. The challenge here that, that they're having is their grants only uh, fund about 100,000 pages per year per institution to be scanned. Uh, Unfortunately, in sort of the, the newspaper universe, that's not very much, but it's still interesting content that's very carefully uh, selected by these institutions that receive these grants because they recognize that they really need to be careful about what they digitize as their funds are quite limited. So in this National Digi Digital Newspaper Program, you'll see that most of the states have participated. Some interesting examples are New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Wyoming. 
But for Massachusetts, uh, I have a very interesting story that I'll tell you in just a moment. So recently on MyHeritage, we've released 52.8 million new newspaper pages from 27 states, with more coming soon from the US, Canada, and Europe. Here's an example of, or excuse me, here are these 27 states, and I've highlighted the Massachusetts title there in blue, because I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, right now, actually. So this was a project we did with the Boston Public Library, uh, one of the largest public libraries in the country. In fact, I think after the Library of Congress itself, it is the second largest you know, sort of public library. It's, it's famous for this building on Boylston Street in the heart of, of Boston with this really ornate reading room. But uh, the work we were doing was out uh, at their archival facility in Roxbury. And if you go out to Roxbury, you uh, enter this amazing uh, repository of some of their materials that don't, uh, aren't stored in the downtown branch. And I wish I could give you a feel for the scale of this building. I'm, much, I'm actually standing on a ladder here on the left. I wish I'd put a, a person in these to give us some scale. But here is uh, some of their newspaper collection in these uh, cardboard cartons. After we uh, had finished there, we had prepared a number of these pallets that you see these cartons sitting on. And we shipped them to our microfilm scanning uh, partner in uh, the Sacramento area of California after we purchased a large quantity of insurance on this truck to ship the microfilm not only there but also back. And uh, this uh, involved over 12,000 rolls of microfilm, uh, producing over 6 million new newspaper pages. Most of these have not been digitized, had not been digitized before. 239 titles with a year range of 1704 to 1974. This project was running for well over two years, just an incredible amount of scanning and digital conversion, OCR work, and then metadata work to identify the issues and to put the right uh, date on every issue. Uh, the cost of the public to the Boston Public Library was actually zero. So just a wonderful example of a public-private partnership where we're able to provide a wonderful service. We're providing all of this content, these images back to the Boston Public Library and in the coming uh, years, I suspect that you'll see uh, when they're ready to publish it, we're, we're ready to give them the content, uh, they'll be pub putting this on their own site for their uh, for their users. So here's uh, this collection, the Boston Public Library. Again, if you hit this uh, icon here, you'll get an extended description. And one thing that we did for this collection is we provided a sort of table that gives us information about the specific titles and the year ranges. So here is the top part of that list. If I scroll down, I'll see, for example, the Boston Globe, one of the, the largest newspapers by circulation in the Boston area for many years. And I want to show you an example of searching this collection. So let me go to, I'm going to start again at the top level research tab. And let me go to newspapers. That's one way I can find is I could just click on newspapers. Another technique that sometimes I'll use is I'll come to our map widget here. I clicked on the United States and I can click on Massachusetts. And it's going to give me a list of most of our largest collections from Massachusetts. So here's this Massachusetts newspapers collection. Let me click on this one. And in this example, what I want to show you is let's try to find a some sort of death notice about a Barney. Uh, his middle name was Corey Cox. And I want to specifically just find him in the Boston Globe. Maybe his family put him uh, put some obituary information if I could type properly in some other newspapers, but in this case, I want just the Boston Globe, and he uh, died somewhere around 1887. So let's do that and do a search. And it comes back with the Boston Globe, March 30th, 1887. It's talking about the, the death of a Barney Corey Cox. That looks quite good, so let's click on that one. And I see the text string here, this is really part of the OCR uh, information. And if I look at the page here, really what I'm looking for is this little bit of purple. If I scroll down here to the bottom left corner, you'll see that not only did his information make it into the newspaper, but he actually got on the front page of the paper, the death of Barney Corey Cox. It talks about him being born in New Bedford in April 1839. 
for more than 28 years. He, he worked at this place. Uh, he leaves a wife, one son, and one daughter. So just uh, really uh, useful for finding things like obituaries. The other wonderful thing about these newspapers is they just contain an incredible amount of local history. Uh, the one example that I want to show you is one of my most favorite human-made natural disasters. And all I need to do here is type molasses. And this happened in 1919. And here I should find a record of what's called the Great Molasses Flood, also known as the Boston Molasses Disaster. And although a little flippant, another term it's known by is the Boston Molassacre. <laughs> a little, little funny, uh, maybe a little sacrilegious as well. But if you zoom into this article, you'll see that there was this gargantuan molasses tank that ruptured and a wave of uh, estimated to be about 2.3 million U.S. gallons uh, rushed through the streets and actually uh, killed a number of people and injured a number of others. So just wonderful types of uh, local history we can get out of these newspapers. Let's go on and talk about some of the U.S. passenger arrival records and some unique uh, things you'll find at MyHeritage and some of the, the treasures that you can hunt for. Uh, I also presented uh, specifically on the work we did here for the New York passenger records in a, in a webinar also here with Jeff. I think it's been almost two years now. But we, we went through these passenger arrival records and we indexed additional uh, names. So in 1898, they started to ask this question about the name and relationship of a relative in the U.S. where the immigrant was coming to be with. Uh, that added 16 million additional names and relationships. And then in 1907, they added a second supplemental question, which was the name and relationship of relatives in the, in the homeland or the old country that they were leaving behind. And that added a, tw a 12 million additional names and relationships. And you'll find those in the uh, collection we call the Ellis Island and other New York passenger lists, 1820 to 1957, uh, with an incredible 113 uh, million records, just a, a gargantuan collection. Let me show an example of a search on this. So here's my grandfather. This is Thomas Joseph Griffiths, my mother's father. He was born on January 11th, 1908. He's from Wales and he immigrated uh, to the U.S. at the age of 28. So let's see if we can find him really quickly in our collection. I'm going to go back to the research tab and we will go to passenger lists under the immigration and travel top level category and here it is. It's the largest one by count and I can search for Thomas Joseph Griffiths, and he arrived in 1928. And let's do a search. And what I want to do is, so I'm not getting the result that I expected, and let me go back and show you why. I'm going to go to the advanced search here. And this is another thing that's really helpful to see. Our advanced search forms have additional options for how precise or imprecise we want the search to be. So in this case, he's actually abbreviated as Thomas J in the record. So I need to say match similar names, which is going to automatically look for initials. Here under similar names, we have a number of phonetic indexing algorithms. So this, you know, we'll find Griffiths maybe with one F and other types of spelling. So let's try this search now. And we should Again, not find him, that is frustrating. Let me just go back and just apologize. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Here he is, so uh, this one right here, Thomas J. Griffiths, uh, 1909. In addition to keying these additional records as well, we actually stitched these two images together. So this was a left side and a right side. And on this case, my grandfather's down here on line 28, so that third from the bottom, Thomas J. Griffiths, he's 19, he was a template worker, uh, gives information about the name of his father that he's leaving behind in Wales, who's 63 years old, and he has a brother, this William Griffiths, that he's coming to be with in Provo, Utah. So that's an example of some of the ex, uh, expanded capabilities that we've added to the U.S. 
excuse me, to the uh, passenger records. But what I wanted to show you, if I also come here to uh, my match list, if I look on matches by people and click record matches, and I can sort now and find the record matches for my grandfather, Thomas Joseph Griffiths. I'll find his sort of card. He has six record matches. And what you'll see here, though, is that this record I just showed you from the uh, Ellis Island uh, passenger list is not one of the records that are here. You see that I had a little bit of trouble finding him with an ad hoc search. And I'm guessing that the record match system is, is having some additional difficulty as well. And for some reason, uh, we just don't have enough contacts for record match to identify that match that I showed you as a good, uh, very high precision match for the record match uh, system. So what about the other ports? Uh, so we've done the same treatment for Boston. It was published just in February, and same thing for Philadelphia. It was published just a month earlier in January, adding millions of additional names and relationships, and there's more coming soon. Honolulu and Baltimore should be released within the next few weeks, and we're following those up with a number of other ports from around the west coast and east coast of the United States, as you see there. All right, so here's the experience of Gary Mokotov. He's sort of a famous genealogist, and he's the publisher and editor of this important uh, Jewish uh, journal and his experience was that he had never been able to find his his grandfather this Morris Mokotov in the Ellis Island database until we had done this work at MyHeritage. As soon as he was able to search for this form of his name, this Mokotow, he was able to find it almost instantly. So encourage you to look for your immigrant ancestors in some of our uh, immigration records you'll find on MyHeritage. We've uh, done a lot of work to make them even more uh, powerful, so to say. So here's the Philadelphia collection. Here's the Boston collection. Again, you'll see the breadcrumbs there that I'm referring to that you can go find them uh, in the passenger list collection. In the case of Philadelphia, you can always just uh, go to uh, the state of Pennsylvania and you'll see it listed uh, with all the other Pennsylvania databases. Another collection I'll show just a quick example from is United States Passport Applications, 1795 to 1925. These are really cool records where uh, we get information here uh, from the applicant giving us his birth date. He's indicating that his father is a native citizen of the United States. And on the next page, so be careful when you look at these. So here's, here's the first page, that photograph on the left, that's actually the photograph of the person on the previous left applicants page and I need to turn the page or the image to the next page to get the photograph of our subject here uh, this man here with his uh, quite interesting photograph another collection sort of like this is the uh, Brazil immigration cards a uh, fairly large collection of 4.7 million records uh, a very robust uh, index but what I find even better than the index are the original cards. Here's a gentleman that is immigrating from the Netherlands. That gives us information about his birth date and the day he's arriving there and that he's coming from Amsterdam. So wonderful, just wonderful, wonderful content that way. I would be amiss if I didn't also mention our US yearbooks collection. Again, another collection that I've spoken specifically about here within uh, the webinar series. Uh, a massive compendium again, 253,000 high school yearbooks from around the country, uh, 36 million pages. We wanted to do something special for this collection and over the course of about a year, we went through and we zoned all of the photographs, all of these portraits and associated these portraits with the names uh, of these students. And as you probably remember from your yearbook, the way these are structured, very tremendously. So it was a bit of a challenging project, but we're happy to have uh, finally concluded it. And so there's also a companion collection called the US Yearbooks Name Index, which has all of these names and portraits uh, sort of uh, married together. Again, so the same number of yearbooks as 253,000 yearbooks, but yielding almost 300,000 uh, names, uh, many with their associated portraits. So in, uh, as an example, here's an example of the famous actor Jimmy Stewart 
I'm very easily able to find my uncle there on the left and my oldest uh, cousin, his oldest daughter, along with my parents and uh, some of my brothers. So if you haven't used our yearbooks collection at MyHeritage, definitely take a look at it. As we, as I thought about this, this talk, really the challenge for me as a presenter is how to represent the massively long tail of collections that we have. Uh, so this first collection that I'll mention in just a moment, this England Wales Birth Index, this is a, a huge collection, uh, well over 100 million records, and then down on the very far end of the, of the spectrum, we'll have something like the parish registers of Kinnerley in Shropshire with maybe just a few hundred records. So how do we find a collection like this? So here's one down in the long-tailed Germans and Hungarians, uh, the 1828 Hungarian land census uh, from Arad County. I'm, I'm assuming that's uh, somewhere in, in Hungary. So let me switch back to the site. Again, I will go to the research tab. I'm gonna hide the advanced search. And in this case, let me just search for a Petru S-Z-U-B-R-A, so this is gonna be a fairly uncommon, at least it's uncommon to me as a person that lives here in the US, uh, last name. And if I search for that and click on results, look at that, I get nine records, but the first one is this collection that's way, way down in our long tail of small, uh, small collections, uh, a record for this Petru, uh, appearing in this Hungarian land census. I can see that he's also uh, in some family trees, or excuse me, other names, maybe not spelled just like him, so this may be a false positive, as is the one below. As I kind of want to illustrate this just to reinforce it, if I want to match this last name just exactly, I'm only interested in cases where uh, it's spelled just like that. I can change it to be match name exactly, and I think if I do a search here, I get, in fact, just one and only one record. So what I'm suggesting is we, we do have this really long tail of collections on my heritage. By long tail, I mean uh, thousands and thousands uh, of collections that really are only gonna surface well if you just happen to have a, a search that's gonna get a, a hit in them, and that's usually gonna be you know, some sort of name, uh, name and place combination. Some others in the last few minutes that I'll point out, these are, I picked some of the more recent uh, collections that you may have missed that, that we've uh, released, uh, a wonderful collection of Canadian uh, obituaries, uh, the 1921 Canada Census, the 1940 Denmark census. So sometimes people stop and say, hey Mike, these are great, but all of my ancestors immigrated from Denmark, you know, in the in the late 1800s. And, I, and while I agree, I would remind them that with the advent of DNA and DNA matches, which is a, a topic for a, another day, with our DNA matches, one thing that we're often trying to do is do descendancy research to figure out how am I related to this, you know, fourth cousin that still lives in Denmark and record collections like this, uh, the very most recent Dania census that's available publicly, the 1940 Denmark census can certainly help us as we do that descendancy research. Uh, I mentioned near the top of my talk, a very large collection of Swedish household examination books. This is sort of that same type of content, but for Finland, uh, the Finland church census and pre-confirmation books, 33 million records, just an amazing collection if you have uh, Finnish ancestors definitely look into that one. Again, uh, one that we've uh, released fairly recently. Uh, the 1939 Register of England and Wales. This is uh, a very important collection uh, that was uh, collected by the uh, British government as they were just starting into the World War II period. It's also particularly important uh, because the 1931 census was uh, destroyed uh, in a fire and they never got around to conducting a census in 1941. So the 1939 Register of English, England and Wales is sort of our last currently available snapshot of the population of the country. You'll see a lot of information there like you do on a regular census. However, unlike many year censuses, this collection includes a full birth date. So you get the birth year, the birth month, and the day of month for people there living in England and Wales, which is a real uh, boon uh, from that collection. Again, there's another uh, bit of treasure you can go look for. Uh, an important collection from Ireland, 
again, some record destruction at the beginning of the uh, Irish Civil War. I think it was 1922 at a, a bombing at an important archive uh, held at the building called the Four Courts. Uh, many uh, other Irish records uh, were uh, tragically destroyed. This is a, a type of a, a land uh, ownership survey that provides a census substitute in some regard. Uh, another recent uh, census that we've released, the 1910 Norway census, along with the 1900 and the 1891 Norway census. If you're like me and have Norwegian family, definitely look uh, to these uh, recently released Norwegian censuses. Another one that I'll just show a brief uh, example of before I wrap up, and this is this very large England and Wales uh, birth index. So this is a civil registration index. So in England uh, and Wales, they started uh, requiring civil registration in 1837. And let me jump over to an example right now that I'll show you of this collection. So here's this England and Wales birth index. Let me zoom this particular view in a little bit. And here I'm putting in the name of one of my family members, William Poling, who was born in 1868. And I'll go ahead and hit search. And I get a record here that has the information I'm looking for. The, the bad news about this content is it doesn't actually give me the exact birthday, it gives me the sort of the quarter, this, this per, the, everyone on this page had births registered in the second quarter or April, May, and June, April, May, and June of 1868. But here at the very top left uh, is my ancestor, William Poling. He's registered in this district called Abergnaffy, which is in Monmouthshire with the volume and page number. And what I do with this is I then go to the government record office and I can order the certificate through this web page. So let me show you the results of how that will work. So if I go to this site, https www.gro.gov.uk slash gro slash content, I'm able to click here and order the, order the certificate. And I think it's now 11 pounds. And a couple weeks later, I'll get a document back in the mail that looks like this. And right there in the middle, that's sort of the, the gold nugget we're looking for. I get essentially the birth certificate or the civil registration record for my ancestor, uh, William Poling. It gives me information about his father and his mother. His mother also there is with a maiden name, Jane Fluke, and information about where they're living and the exact uh, day of registration as well as where as when and where this person was born. So if you have English ancestry, definitely look into getting these certificates. They're very, certainly quite important in documenting uh, the exact days of, of our families. And we have these collections not only for births, but also deaths from the exact same time period, as well as marriages from 1837 to 2005. Finally, as I just uh, about to conclude here, I just can't stress enough uh, the importance of the MyHeritage Family Tree Collection on MyHeritage. Oftentimes at conferences, I get asked the question, you know, what's the difference between MyHeritage and some of the other large genealogical sites and services? And one of the things that I always like to point out is that a, a large percentage, uh, approximately half of our users are not based in the US and Canada. So conversely, that means about half of our users, I think just over half, are based elsewhere. So we have a very different user community. Our site's in over 42 languages and has been for many, many years. Uh, just has been tremendously successful in attracting interest from all sorts of, of genealogists from France and Norway and Spain and all over the world. Uh, I could take all day listing uh, the countries where we have just tremendous uh, communities from. Uh, yeah, so definitely look at searching the MyHeritage Family Tree Collection. The system will do this in an automated way using what we call smart matches. But just like I showed with record matches, smart matches are again tuned for very, very high precision. And if we want to really fester out all of the uh, little nuggets down in here, will often need to be searching this one directly. If I go to the site on the, under the research tab, it's 
this collection, the My Heritage Family Trees, is right here under Family Trees. Uh, and I can search it uh, with a lot of different uh, ways. I'm currently showing you the advanced search where I can add relatives. I can add all sorts of relatives, like maybe I have a father and I want to add a, a child uh, or a sibling. Uh, I can just make a very powerful search of the My Heritage Family Tree collection. And then finally, my last point or advice is definitely use the Record Detective, another technology we have on My Heritage to find other records. So this combines the power of smart matches. So again, tree to tree matches with record matches. And it really provides record to record matching. So these are additional records associated with the currently viewed historical record. And I'll show you an example. And it also provides record to trees matching. Sometimes in a list of record detective matches, you'll see a link back to a person in a tree. Let me show you uh, those examples real quick before I wrap up. Let me get to the right page here. So here are just three quick examples of some uh, record detective matches. So this is a case where I've done a search in Super Search and I found a record for John Kleivert, if I'm saying it properly. This is an important collection called the Passenger and Immigration List, PILI, that documents uh, passenger arrivals that might not have been captured through passenger uh, lists or uh, records of people who are arriving before uh, passenger records were maybe even uh, created or through other sources like a naturalization record. So if I come down here to the bottom, I see that this John Clivert is also in a record collection called Russians Immigrating to the United States, as well as this, he is actually in, a, in our Philadelphia passenger list collection, so I can go find more information about him there. Here's the next example, this Hannah Hannevold. She's uh, going to Montreal. She departed from Liverpool. Again, so she arrived in Canada, but then probably eventually made her wife to the United, uh, excuse me, made her way, maybe she's still living uh, in Canada. Uh, this is a, or when, you know, maybe she never did immigrate. This is a British and, pass, and Irish passenger list from 1890. But down here at the bottom, I see a record to what's probably a headstone for her, a 1940 U.S. federal census, so some uh, evidence that she did immigrate eventually to the United States as well as 1930, 1900, and a link to a record of perhaps a death uh, record there in Chicago, Cook County, Illinois. And then finally another example, this Marie Fresser. Uh, she is shown here with a record detective match at the very bottom where she's not only in the 1910 census, but also in our Ellis Island collection. Maybe she was coming back from a trip. As I saw above that she's born here. She was born in Montana, but the Ellis Island collection certainly includes US citizens returning to the country. And uh, this lovely example here that I'd like to show of a photograph of this woman in some sort of alumni directory. So there she is on the right, Marie S. Fesser, uh, yeah, president of Clarkia, chairman of some uh, committee in, and member of a, looks like to be a sorority of some type. All right, and finally, as I conclude, because I often get this question uh, at the end of uh, the MyHeritage talks is, what are the prices? The best way to see the prices are to log out of MyHeritage and go to the bottom, or the bottom footer, and you'll see a price list link right there, and if you click on that, you'll see a page that gives you uh, the current pricing and the package options, and I would just note to encourage you to take a look at what currency it's showing. I hope that was helpful, gives you some uh, information about how to search a little bit more effectively, and to encourage you to keep on hunting. Again, there's my name, Mike Mansfield, and my email address, and with that, I'll ask Jeff to jump back in. Very good, Mike. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, very well done. And you know, for a first time, you know, give, given a brand new presentation for the first time, ever, uh, everyone, it takes a lot of work. And uh, you did a nice job. And Mike, the comments here in the in the chat log uh, are such that uh, that they really enjoyed it, and a lot of this was new to them. So uh, thanks everyone here for participating. Uh, Mike, I'm going to switch over and do some door prizes. While I'm doing that, uh, I think. 
just about 10 seconds ago, your your mic started getting tired. Will you unplug it, wait a few seconds, and then plug it back in? And that's usually the resolution for that. So, I'm, uh, thanks. So I'm going to switch over here, everyone. Uh, if you want to attend our uh, upcoming live webinars, just head up to FamilyTreeWebinars.com. Uh, and do a slash my heritage webinars and that will give you the my heritage specific webinars or just leave that off and you can uh, see everything that we have to offer up at the webinar site it's time for door prizes so if you're here you're eligible to win our first door prize we've got a one year my heritage complete plan and that gives you access to everything that's up on the site and i need to update this now because uh, we're now up to 9.7 billion historical records so let me go and find uh who wants <laughs> who wants a webinar membership let's go up to and say congratulations to Catherine gradup Catherine, congratulations thanks for being here today you've got a one-year membership coming uh your way uh advantage or uh, perk to attending our live sessions is uh you can be part of this. And let's do a My Heritage DNA test kit. So, uh, and you're welcome, Catherine, who writes in with lots of exclamation points. <laughs> Very happy. Let's do a My Heritage DNA test kit. And uh, for this, uh, let's go and say congratulations to Teresa Carlo. Teresa, uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, so, I'll be in touch with you guys to get your contact information. Okay. Let's uh, let's now go back to Mike and uh, Mike. Are you, oh Teresa, she's she's just ecstatic here, Mike, uh, for her door prize. Uh, let's do. Uh, we've got we've got a few questions here, Mike. Are you ready for these? Sure, let's go. Okay, yeah, yeah Mike sounds great now. Well. Mike and Mike's mic sound great. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay. Uh, Catherine's wondering, and it, Mike, if you want to switch to do live demos for any of this, just let me know, and I'll switch this right back over to you. Uh, Catherine says okay. um, when, she's, when she's doing a search and she gets uh, the results listed category by category, she's wondering, is it possible to disable or turn off or make temporarily invisible some of the category results uh, she says like for example like family search trees is that possible that's a that's a great question uh, unfortunately the answer is no there there's not a user setting to do that I, I think it's a it's a wonderful su a suggestion though and yeah. honestly what, what what I would suggest though is going just to a specific category so I don't know if Jeff could flip the control back to me for just a moment yeah you bet here you go uh, uh, I could show even how I uh, use the site, uh, you know, in a different way. Yeah. So if I'm looking just for, you know, say I do want to find something like a military record. So instead of doing a global search and then dealing with, you know, all the categories and lists that will come back, I'll just go right to the military category. And all of our categories and, and groups that we call them have a template that will search just the records within that sub category of the entire set so that might be helpful is you know just doing more limited searches instead of global searches and then winnowing down the global search is just go do more targeted searches either by category or even down to very specific collections like you know in this case if I was looking for someone in, uh, that had uh, served in the Civil War in the US Civil War I may just want to go to this collection this US Civil War soldiers and that would be a more specific collection. I wouldn't get people intermixed from, say, World War I draft with Civil War, stuff like that. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Mike. Now, I've got a couple questions about uh, different countries and uh, what content might you have available for different countries. Brian's wondering about UK and South Africa. Susan's wondering about Scotland and Canada. Uh, could you guide us to learning how we would know uh, what records you might have for what countries? Sure, and I think I'm, I'm still displaying. Uh, is that yes. correct, Jeff? Yep. Yeah, so the best way to do this is, again, go to the, the top research tab, and at the bottom you'll see a, a map that's clickable. So, for example, if I wanted to look at, I think Scotland was the suggestion. So here we have a group for United Kingdom and its constituent uh, countries and then all the other countries of uh, continental Europe, and I can click just Scotland, and I'll get a list of 
a number of, of our Scottish collections. Many of the largest collections will be listed here. Again, I would just give this caveat that we have some, some large compendiums, like that collection of uh, books that I mentioned. There's likely to be Scottish-specific books buried down in that compendium. But this is sort of uh, some of the larger Scottish-specific collections. And again, some of these are also compendiums, like we, you see we have a uh, compendium of United Kingdom Select Burial and Cremation Index there. Uh, so the other country I think I heard requested was Australia. So let's just go look at that. I'll go to this uh, geographic region, region often called Oceania, if I'm saying it correct. And I can look at Australia or by its states or territories here. So for Australia, we have a, a really nice collection of newspapers from the National uh, Library there or the Trove Project and some other uh, nice uh, collections. We do have a, a large uh, collection of electoral records coming for Australia here uh, in the next few weeks. Oh, really? Wow. Uh, Australia, unfortunately, part of the British uh, Commonwealth, they, they, they've they long had a tradition of collecting censuses like the British every 10 years. But unlike other parts of the British Commonwealth, after they've collected the statistics of the census, they unfortunately have been destroying the population schedules. So mm -hmm. things like uh, electoral registers become very important uh, substitutes. So here's an example of a smaller one from Queensland of electoral rolls, sort of a, a substitute for the loss of some of the, many of the censuses there in Australia. Okay. I hope that helps. Yeah, oh, that's exciting to hear about what's coming. And as you're talking, now I've got dozens of people saying, well, what about this country? What about this country? Do you, pu <laughs> do you publish anywhere what's coming? Uh, do we publish a uh, list uh, or our future roadmap? Yeah. Generally, no. Okay, uh, what I would recommend is keep your eye on a good place to always watch for My Heritage News is blog.myheritage.com. This is a very active blog. It's updated almost daily. Uh, new collections, new initiatives that, that we uh, release will be uh, discussed here. Uh, so, you know, definitely keep an eye on that, you know, maybe check it once in a while, uh, see uh, the things that we're, we're doing and talking about here. That's a good way to keep on top of, of what's coming. Another way, just I would, I would mention, I can also go to the research t uh, tab, and under the item, under this drop-down here, I can go to the collection catalog, and one of the options of the collection catalog is I can sort by last updated or most recently published. We do have a few that we feature up here at the top, and then you see that we've been updating some of our tree collections. Those are done on a very regular basis, and some of the other things that we've been doing uh, more recently. Excellent. So I hope that helps. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. We've got uh, Joe who's wondering, back when you're showing us the newspapers, I think you did a search where you could limit it to... Oh, a, a certain phrase, and by a certain year, is it is it possible? Uh, she's wondering, um, can you add a, a year span there to search, you know, ten years worth uh, at a time, or would you do that one year at a time? Good question. So I went to the top level newspaper category here. So again, this is going to search across all of our newspapers, including that large collection of Australian, these ones from the Library of Congress. Let me go into just a specific, well, I can look at it here. So if I put in a year, like let's say 1908, under this max ah. match flexibly drop down, you see down here I can do a year range. Yeah. So if I wanted to say you know, something like 1906 to 1910, I could do this. And yeah, I certainly do this quite a bit when I'm, when I'm not sure about when someone died, if I'm looking for some type of obituary, I do use this quite a bit. Okay. So Joe, there yeah. is your... Uh, answer exactly so thanks mike uh, for uh -huh. that debbie's wondering and oh go ahead i would just point out that may this drop down may only be, be available in what we call the advanced search so most of our okay. templates have what's called a basic search you'll see that that little drop down widget isn't there if you want to see what other things this template supports just come up here and click on advanced search and you'll see that we give you some other options okay. there all right so the advanced Sorry. search link everyone uh, real important you get more more flexibility by using it. Good. Thanks, Mike. Yes. Sorry. Back to you, Jeff. Oh, don't ever be sorry. Thanks. Uh, Debbie's wondering, uh, is there a way to change one of the default settings? Like Debbie uses the 
match name exactly, and she really likes that, and she'd she'd like it to be the default option for all of her searches. Is there a way to to have that be sticky? You know, another great uh, request. Uh, okay. Whenever I present like this, I often compile lists of, of yeah. items for our product team, and yeah. if Debbie's okay with it, I will include that. Excellent. And send it to my colleagues, yes. I think it's a great suggestion. Okay, another good reason to be here at these live sessions. You get to be part of the future of my heritage. There you go. Help us be better, right? Yep. Thanks, everyone. Uh, okay. So specifically to those world, the World War I registration records, which I personally love, uh, Teresa's, Teresa's just wondering, uh, Mike, if you know about this. She says it, um, it seems that if even if a man was born outside of the U.S. that they were required to register, even if they were not U.S. citizens? Uh, do, do you know, it was everyone that was a resident here required to uh, register? My understanding is yes. I, I've, I've seen some examples of, uh, like, merchant uh, seamen, or these men that work aboard ships in the port of New York. They're not U.S. citizens or even trying to become a citizen, yet they were uh, being picked up in their registration. The the newspaper articles and things you can find, again, go search some of those newspaper collections if you want to search it more deeply. They, they were very serious about this registration. They were not fooling around. If a young man of age was not or didn't have a, a sort of their receipt, their registration card that they would have received at registration time, they were subject to... Uh, immediate fines, imprisonment, or immediate impressment into the army. So I think some of these non-citizens uh, in the country just didn't want to uh, sort of risk it, right? They're just going to go register and produce this card. That, 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 that The card would have showed that they were actually an alien, and I think the odds that they would have been called up would have been extremely low, but they registered anyway. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, Victoria is wondering, so it sounds like she's got a tree on my heritage right now. She's wondering, is it possible to upload a new and more complete tree to replace her existing tree there? Any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something that actually a lot of our users do, is they may have more than one tree on their site. And so with a MyHeritage uh, service subscription, that includes the ability to have one tree or two trees or 50 trees, as many trees as you'd like. Like in my case, I've, I've never actually merged my wife's tree with mine. So that might be an example where I would want to have both my tree and her tree in the same account. And what I can do is I can come here to Family Tree and I can go to Import GEDCOM. And so I can get a GEDCOM from a number of sources, you know, other software like Legacy, other websites and service or other software also exports JEDCOM and I can and I can upload it here. When I'm done with that upload, it will if I come back to manage trees, instead of just showing one tree like I have on this site, it would show two or three or ten or fifty. And there would be an option over here where I could tell this site which one to use as my default. And then there's also a widget would appear where I can switch between my two trees uh, fairly easily as well. So the answer is yes, absolutely, and people do it all the time. Okay. All right, good. Well, Mike, we've made our way through all of the the questions here that pertain to our topic here. Uh, appreciate right. it. Uh, you're welcome here any time, Mike. Uh, always a pleasure to have you here. Any any final thoughts that you'd just anxious to share with us before we say goodbye? Uh, just, just keep on hunting. Happy hunting. Uh, Take advantage of both, you know, the automated searching that we do with record matching and smart matching and record, record detective. But again, realize, please, that that going that extra mile, that extra effort will, you know, we can find records that, that the systems won't surface to us uh, automatically. And, and they're wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And thanks to all of you, wherever and whenever you are around the world, for sharing part of your day with us. And remember, life is short. Do genealogy first. Bye, everyone. Bye, Mike. Thanks. Goodbye.